talk about building dreams. Meet the mastermind behind world-class landmarks. Moshe Safdi talks with Chan Soo Kian. My name is Chan Soo Kian. I'm an architect practicing out of Singapore. I went to study in the United States. I received my architecture degree from the Yale School of Architecture. Following that, I returned to Singapore and established SCDA Architects. In my work, I strive for an architecture that is timeless, both classic and in the humanist tradition. I also strive to ground my project in its locale, meaning that I seek to respond to the climatic and cultural nuances of the place I'm designing it. And that's why I relate to Mr. Safdie's philosophy, because he is a humanist and a classicist at heart. One of Mr. Safdie's uh, latest project, Marina Bay Sands, is a very important catalyst for the new downtown of Singapore. It creates a good waterfront that relates back to the Marina Bay, which is the symbolic heart of downtown Singapore. I was happy to be able to meet up with Moshi Shafti at Marina Bay Sands and to be able to spend some time with him to understand his design philosophies in architecture. Mr. Safdi, you have mentioned that the architect Louis Khan has had a major influence on your work. In what ways did he influence you in your designs? Uh, Louis Kahn was a, I mean, uh, Louis Kahn was a great architect. I really learned from Kahn as I spent a year in his practice about how to practice architecture. And my own practice is very much in the image of Kahn. He was involved with the project from the moment he began conceiving it to the last minute of construction. He never gave more importance to any phase. Construction, detailing, was as important as design. The practice was a process. Decision making was a process. From the minute you think about a program in a site to the moment where it takes form in real materials. And to me, that's architecture. And if you shortchange any of the phases of design, if you lose control, if you're not involved uh, in any of these phases, architecture comes out shortchanged. And it shows in the final product. Um, you have said that a building has the ability to move the human spirit, to inspire. What inspired you when you were designing the Holocaust Memorial Museum? The Holocaust Memorial Museum was maybe the most difficult project I ever had to design because of the emotional charge, because of the symbolic uh, 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 implications of every move you make in the design. Uh, for me, at the beginning, it was thinking about all the things I did not want to do. I didn't want to build a big building on a beautiful mountain with the trees in, at Yad Vashem. I did not want a building that felt like business as usual building with beautiful materials and details and doors and windows. I wanted something that felt almost like geology or like archaeology or like a quarry. I wanted it to be so basic that you wouldn't think about it as a building. And that's when the idea came, well, if I don't want to build on top of the hill, let me cut through the mountain. And then the building becomes completely underground. First, I thought I'll carve it in the rock, but the rock was too soft, so I made it with concrete. But it was a response to trying to create something so special and particular to the story that is being told by the exhibits. And then perhaps the moment of true inspiration was when I felt, how do you end this museum? What happens after you are told the story? And I felt that the most appropriate conclusion is to come in back to the light, to come to the other side of the mountain, to break into the light. You look at the forest, a uh, sense of renewal, life prevailed, we are here. This is a terrible story, but life goes on and we are here. And uh, this is a case where architecture has the last word. What, in your opinion, makes a good building? Well, a good, a good building is, is, is responding to the many, many facets of, of what architecture is all about. A good building must resonate with its program, its purpose. If it's a school, it has to be a wonderful place for learning. A good building has to be very expressive of the craft of its construction, because architecture is material. So the language of architecture is the way materials come together, the way structure is expressed. Architecture must be very specific to place, 
It must resonate with its culture, with its topography, with its climate. It must feel like it belongs. Uh, each of these is, is an ingredient. So when all these things come together, you have great architecture. That's right. So in your overseas project, you tend to see the scope through, like in the Marina Bay Sands. You open an office here in Singapore, presumably to oversee the construction process. Yes, as we get involved in bigger and bigger projects, uh, this becomes a big team effort. You've got to control the product to the end. You cannot just do a design in Boston, send it off, come three years later and hope to see something that you intended. And that means for us, people on location, on the site, controlling the construction, uh, uh, advising the contractor, uh, developing the geometries on the shop drawings. We had 15 people from Marina Bay Sands in Singapore through the four years. When you are confronted with a mega scale building, such as Marina Bay Sands, how do you handle the public realm and how do you, and what impact does it have on the city when you have such a large project? When you're working on a project of the scale of Marina Bay Sands, you first of all need to recognize that you're not designing a building. You're designing a piece of city. So as soon as you do that, you understand that the city does not begin with the specific spaces, but with the public realm. The public realm is streets, piazzas, movement, circulation. It's the spine of life. Uh, my model for Marina Bay was to think about Roman cities and, and Greek cities who always had the spine, the Cardo Maximus. And these spines were the main drag that told you that this is the framework of the city. Uh, the promenade that the URA created on the water and our main spine become one indoor, outdoor. It's maybe the first urban place where indoor and outdoor are fused together, parallel but working together. And then there are the view corridors that connect inland. Around that, you start putting the pieces, convention, theater, museum, hotel, and each is a challenge to, on its own. The Art Science Museum, the theaters, the hotel, the sky park, each then becomes a particular architectural scale problem. I think what was exciting here is we started by saying this is mega scale. We better make it, humanize it. When we positioned the hotels, three of them, of course I decided to make three so they wouldn't make a wall so you could look through it, and all the other program functions, there was very little outdoor space left except the promenade. And I still wanted to create parks, swimming pools. And that's where the idea of the sky park was born. Uh, as uh, out of desperation. Uh, we had the model in the office, we had the three towers, we had everything, and there was no, no land left. It was a big piece of balsa wood. Yeah. And, you know, I said, oh, this, you know, that's a good scale. Put it on the model. And all of a sudden it seemed self-evident. You know, why not up in the sky to have lots of open space? The main gesture of that, that street in the arcade is a powerful one, and uh, when you were designing it, did you conceptualize the surrounding developments that may come up, and do you see that as part of an outdoor space that will link to the future master plan? I think it's important when you design a project that has a long life, but a changing life, that you separate between the elements which are permanent, the promenade, the grand arcade, they're permanent, they're there. The shops will change. Louis Vuitton comes, Chanel goes. You know, it's, uh, it's dynamic. And you've got to treat these as not permanent installations. Therefore, your infrastructure has to have the strength to hold its form and shape, defining the public domain independently of all the interior design machinations of the, sh of the shop owners. It's very much like the old bazaars, the medieval bazaars, the Muslim bazaars of the Middle East,
They begin with an infrastructure of arcades and so on, which is masonry, massive, has a long life, hundreds of years. And within them, the merchants come and open the merchandise and come and go and change things. And gardens are created and trees are planted and so on and so forth. So that it's important to think about the city in terms of long term and that which changes all the time. There seem to be a lot of talk about sustainability. Does an ethical architecture necessarily have to be sustainable? An ethical architecture has to be many things, including sustainable. I think it would be a mistake to think that sustainability is the centerpiece of the ethics of architecture. The centerpiece of the ethic of architecture is the impact that architecture has on the life of those who experience it. And around that comes the question of resources. And sustainability is an aspect of resources. Buckminster Fuller said that if we can build with less, we can build more. And that's part of an ethic because if we can build with less, we can provide more to more people. It's a socialistic concept of a responsibility to provide as good an environment for as many people in the world. Now we've expanded that to appreciate that, that we have a limited uh, amount of resources, limited energy, limited materials that come from nature. We need to recycle, we need to use the materials that we can replenish. So that becomes another facet of that ethic. But if we forget that the reason we're doing it all is to create a, a wholesome and, 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 and inspiring environment for people, then we lose track of the fact that sustainability is in the service of that environment. So I like the term responsible architecture. Does a building respond? in a positive and affirmative way to its needs, or does it not? If you're designing a school, there are many ways to interpret what makes a good school, or what makes a good curriculum, or what is the relationship between students and teachers that all become part of architecture. But I do believe that while there are many ways to answer the question, it is valid to say, does something work or not work? It is valid to be answerable to the community. The community has the right to say, we judge, we make judgment about that which you built for us. And that brings us back to the fact that yes, uh, even though uh, there are no absolutes, there is an ethic to architecture. And sometimes the ethics can be dictated by developers. Um, case in point, you have a building I think Habitat 2, that has been demolished. And the building is about 25 years old. That ethic is being prevalent in Singapore. What do you think of but, this but culture of, of knocking down buildings and rebuilding them? Uh, developers intervene affecting the ethics, but they themselves are motivated by single, by single force, uh, financial return, right. commercial uh, expediency. The question of demolishing buildings which are still fully useful has to do actually with bad planning. Uh, we have a tendency to dramatically change zonings uh, as uh, urbanization takes place and as demand increases. So what happened, even though Singapore is probably one of the better planned places on the planet, nevertheless, through the pressures that the city is growing and land is scarce and so on, Massive rezoning takes place. As soon as you've changed the zoning, you've changed the value of the land, and you then force the replacement of buildings because they become financially shortchanged by the fact that something much denser can replace them. It's a mistake to think that the developer acted immorally or unethically. It is actually the government rezoning that caused it to happen, not the developer's greed or anything like that. They just took advantage of the situation created for them by the rezoning. Which leads us to the question, is it possible to zone the city in a series of sequences in which the old does not become obsolete? This is a fundamental city planning problem that I don't think we've solved yet. What happens is the city starts expanding in a concentric way. 
low density first. Then as it grows and grows, you want to create higher density in the center. The way we do it now is we demolish one generation of buildings, build higher. Then we demolish again and build denser. It would be good to think of a city as having nomadic growth, something like the way uh, a nautilus shell grows. It starts and then it expands and it moves on. It doesn't demolish the beginning of its house. It just adds on to it, adds on to it. If a city could become denser as we add on and add on, that which we began with wouldn't become obsolete. Now, this means recognizing growth and change and densification as part of the form of a city. And that is something we're still exploring uh, from first principles. Sabin once said that no great architecture can occur without great clients. Wise man. Do you choose your clients? I think it's a mistake to say I choose my clients. The cli my clients choose me. Right. When the client chooses you and the project is not in line with your beliefs, do you... That happens a lot. I mean, but I, I would say that my own experience as an architect is before you are offered a project, there is a process of uh, uh, courting. Uh, a developer checks out an architect. They might approach a few architects to get to know them. They might do a competition. They might do interviews. In that process, they get to see uh, what the architect is about and match it against what they think they want. So there is that process of mutual examination. By the time you're offered a job, they have uh, done some homework to decide that you represent what they want. It does happen that somebody comes to you with a job with a variety of motivations. They might want your good reputation to help them change the zoning. Uh, there might be all kinds of motivations, but that their objectives as a client are not compatible with yours as an architect. And you have to be wise enough to say, that's not for me. Asia that is very uh, brand conscious and governments, developers, they engage um, international star architects, um, you know, for PR value, commercial um, incentives. Being a star architect yourself, um, what do you think of the process of uh, commodifying architects, packaging them and then a lot of times selling them for commercial agendas? There's a positive side to the star architect phenomena and a negative side. The positive side is that if you happen to be in the league, it gives you enormous leverage. It gives you leverage to push ideas forward. It give you, gives you leverage to realize those ideas. The risks of uh, the star architect phenomena is that often uh, they are hired for reasons secondary to architecture, as you say, the branding, the publicity, the promotion, promotional value. So the question is, what does the architect so chosen in that category do with that position? You can do it in a way that allows you to be ex exploited, uh, or you can do it to further your architectural objectives by virtue of your position. And so I think we can't just write it off as being a negative phenomena. It has a positive and a negative. It depends on the architect and what they do with it. But the reality of it is that for young architects today, there seems to be a trend that in order to be recognized, the architects will have to in some way accept the universal language of the Western idiom of architecture. I think that there is a globalization force that brings about sameness. But that is cross, across the entire culture. Architecture is trapped in it with everything else. How do we overcome that? In part, by really looking for the specificity of a project in terms of place, in terms of program, in terms of uh, uh, the materiality, the, the technologies available in a place. Uh, after all, building in India is very different from building in Singapore 
and building in Singapore is very different from building in Boston. And we as architects need to recognize these differences and give them expression in the architecture. Uh, I think the problem of young architects is that they believe that you have to have a recognizable style and that that is what gives you the branding potential. And there's a contradiction between the notion of a recognizable style and making architecture fit in different ways in different places. I know that the critics of my own work often say he's all over the place, there's no consistency. I mean, here in Jerusalem, he's building in limestone and, uh, you know, bearing walls, and uh, he's done Toronto Airport with uh, steel structures and high technology space frames. But the fact is, Toronto and Jerusalem are very different places. And an airport is different from doing, uh, say, a Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem. I have no problem with the fact that they come out differently. But that's a dilemma of contemporary architecture, very central one. What advice would you give a young architect signing out right now? I'd say make sure you got a passion for it. Be convinced that you have a passion for it. Because in the scheme of things, it's not a profession today that's highly rewarded. It takes years to establish an independent position as a practitioner and a designer. The difficulty of producing architecture of any quality is extraordinary because you're going against the currents of the commercial world and, and just everything that's sort of force, forcing towards compromise. And therefore, you've got to be totally dedicated and passionate. Otherwise, better not stick with it. But if uh, you have the passion and you stick with it, it can be very, very rewarding. Thank you very much. Thank you.